Praise a higher family. He's the most high, holy, and eternal, king of all kings, the only true wise and living God, the Almighty. Okay, so this is the part two video to the video you've just seen, namely on the border of wickedness, uh, part one. So uh, we're just going to go straight in to pick up really from what we got to in the previous video. Now looking at Edom, essentially. So I'm not going to provide too much commentary in this particular video. We're just going to do a straight reading of the scriptures neat. We may come back in other subsequent videos to pick up on some of the themes, but hopefully it will give you much food for thought. And you'll actually see in the unfolding of the scriptures we're going to come on to look at that essentially what we're really seeing in the, I guess, the interactions we see between European and non-European brown uh, people, particularly with Yashrolites and also Africans, is really essentially play out the age-old battle, I can only call it, between Jacob and Esau. But uh, let's go in, into this video now and have a look at these scriptures. And as I say, we will come on to do further commentary around them in subsequent videos, I'm sure. So uh, let's jump straight in. Or well, we came to understand when we looked at the previous slide of Revelation 17.10, which actually showed a representation of the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream, that we're currently under the rule of a nation called Edom. So who or what then is Edom? So I've not actually shown the actual um I've not actually shown the actual scriptures here, really more for speed, but you can actually refer to them. So the book of Jasher and um, in the book of Jasher, Jasher isn't, a, isn't what we call a canonized book, but have, we are given evidence within the word of God for accepting the book of Jasher as a valid biblical book. Because if you recall, the book of Jasher is referenced as a biblical book in Joshua 10, 13, and also 2 Samuel 1, 18, and also 2 Timothy 3, verse 8 as well, all give evidence for the book of Jasher. Um, so again, I won't go through all of them, but for instance, Joshua 10, 13 says, And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. This is, all, of course, talking of Joshua one of the camp when he led his initial campaign into the, into the promised land. Um, the other reference for us accepting book of Jasher from the word of God, from our current canonized 66 books of, in the current Bibles that we have um, today is 2 Samuel 1 18 where it says also he bade them teach the children of Judah the use of the bow behold it is written in the book of Jasher as well so as I say we've got biblical evidence for accepting the book of Jasher and the book of Jasher chapter 61 tells us that it, it was actually Zepho who was actually the grandson of Esau who actually became the first king of it was called Italia back in those days, um, but of Italy, essentially, um, as well. So they give us further evidence as well for accepting Rome as Edom um, as well. And also, to, and more interestingly, the actual um, New Year's Day, the day we actually accept today as being New Year's Day, the 1st of January, was actually in antiquity known as Zepho's Day. It was actually the day that the people of this early Italian civilization designated as a day to, com to commemorate the memory of Zepho, the grandson of Esau. So as I've said repeatedly, really, that um, many of the actual festival days or in of Mystery Babylon, um, well, are not altogether what, what we are being told that they are. And I have actually provided um, podcasts and also videos actually looking at a number of these things as well. 
I did provide one most recently. It's called The Hidden Significance of Christmas. And it also looks at the actual, well, the actual true narrative really behind the Christmas festival and what we're actually are celebrating in actual fact. Um, it's not, um, has nothing to do with the association with the birth of Christ at all, because of course he wasn't born on Christmas Day. But uh, again, that's a, another story for, for, for another day. Yes, so, so as I say, um, who then is Esau? And um, what does that really have to do with us as, as um, Yashraelite people? Well, let's have a look at what, what Yahuwah actually says about Esau. So why is Yahuwah saying things like this? So Malachi 1, verses 2 to 3, he's saying here, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet she say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau, Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons or the Shadim of the wilderness. And so, does uh, Yahuwah hate? Because we're we're being told, or really being sold, a uh, narrative, certainly in Christendom, that Yahuwah loves everyone. Yet here, quite clearly, Yahuwah is saying, well, I love Jacob, but I hated Esau. And this isn't really to, um, I'm not saying this uh, just to be contentious, but this is what Yahuwah, this is what the word of God is saying. This is what Yahuwah is saying. And really, as Yahuwah has said, as he said to Cain, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted, but if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. So Yahuwah here is saying quite clearly, he's not a respecter of persons. He's not being partial. If a person is doing what is acceptable, then of course he will be loved and will be accepted. But if he's doing something that is, in, that is contrary to God, then, of course, that is not acceptable to Yahuwah, is what he's saying here, in effect. So why is Yahuwah saying this? And then why does Yahuwah then go on to say things like this? Amos 1, 11 to 12. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom, and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. So Yahuwah is saying, number one, because he pursued his brother with the sword. Number two, and cast off all pity. Number three, his anger tore perpetually. And number four, he kept his wrath forever. So Yahuwah is saying this is the indictment of the things he has against Edom, of the things that Edom has done, as to why he is saying that Esau was hated. As he was saying in Malachi 1, verses 2 to 3. And then Yahuwah then goes on to say things like this. Go to Joel 3, verse 1 to 3. So Yehur is here speaking of the day of the Lord. He's saying here, But behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and part in my land. And they've cast lots for my people, and have given a boy for an harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. So he's saying here that he's wroth because of what has been done to his heritage, Israel. So we've also discussed in previous Sabbath sessions, we've looked at Psalm 83 particularly, how Yahuwah has said that there are nations in the earth who are confederate against him and against his people, who have conspired and come together to say, well, let's agree to remove Israel from being a nation at all. Let's block them off the face of the earth so that no one has even any remembrance of them. So currently we have a people who are saying that they are Israel, but they're in the land in the time of the Gentiles, where the prophecy says that Israel would not return to her land until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. That's from Luke 21, 24. So anyone currently in the land of Israel in the time of the Gentiles, and I think we can see it's currently the Gentiles that are ruling, is a Gentile, is what the word of God is saying. 
and not a Jew. So he's saying here that because they've actually parted his land, so many are looking to the land of Israel to be partitioned, but the land of Israel has already been partitioned. So as late as, I think, the 1940s, I think some of the eastern lands of Israel were further partitioned and given to Jordan. So the lands already were long partitioned long ago. And also they scattered his heritage among the nations. So we find ourselves, we are scattered. And really there's no, no, no continent on the earth where you won't find Yashraelites who have been scattered really to the four corners of the earth. But still Yahur is our hope. He's promised to, to gather us. But it's saying that they also did something else quite grievous, as far as Yahuwah is concerned. It's saying they cast lots for my people. So we looked at this whole principle of the casting of the lot to understand what Haman had done in ancient Babylon. And had he succeeded, he would have launched or unleashed a genocidal campaign against um, Yahuwah's people um, in the earth at that time. So it's saying that this kind of campaign is actually being currently being waged against the people of Yahuwah um, as well. But I won't go too, far, too deeply into that. But it's saying here that they gave a boy for an harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. And there's only one set of people who were actually sold when well, they sold a boy for an harlot. And that did actually happen to the Asherite people in slavery. If you recall towards the ending of slavery, it became more difficult for slave owners to actually import slaves. So they began a program of, of breeding slaves and they would actually have, or appoint a stud. So they'd look for a black man who had, was, had a very big, um, strong physique. And they would really set him to, essentially, to, to, um, to breed, essentially, with many Yashraelite women to actually have other slaves or to give birth to other slave children um, as well. So this did happen to Israel in slavery. And, of course, they were sold for wine that they might drink that um that were sold for everything, or Israel was made a mode of exchange. And uh, we are aware of that. So um, these are all the things that Yehur is saying are the reasons why he's displeased um, with Esau. And I think we really can see, really, that we're, but we're not favoured um, by Esau. In the lands where we, we are currently find ourselves today. But then Yahuwah then goes on to say, Ezekiel 35, verses 1 to 5, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir and prophesy against it. And say unto it, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against thee, and I will stretch out mine hand against thee, and I will make thee most desolate. So I will lay thy cities waste, and thou, shalt be most, and thou shalt be desolate, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. And, and why is Yahuwah doing this? He said, because thou hast had a perpetual hatred, and hast shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time that their iniquity had an end. So here, a higher is implicating Edom for, well, gross mistreatment of, of his people in the earth. Yahuwah even goes on further to explain another um, reason for his displeasure. Jeremiah 49, verses 7 to 10. He's saying here, concerning Edom, thus saith the Lord of hosts, is wisdom no more in Timan? Is counsel perished from the prudent? Is their wisdom vanished? Flee ye, turn back, dwell deep, O inhabitants of Dedan. For I will bring the calamity of Esau upon him, the time that I will visit him. If great gatherers come to thee, would they not leave some of the gaining grapes? If thieves by night, they will destroy till they have enough. But I have made Esau bare, I have uncovered his secret places, and he shall not be able to hide himself. His seed is spoiled, and his brethren and his neighbours, and he is not. But leave thy father as children, I will preserve them alive, and let thy widows trust in me. So here Yahuwah is, is implicating, or saying what most displeases him about Esau, and that's the fact that when they 
go and have an interaction or to invade a nation, they take everything. They don't leave a single crumb of anything remaining for the people that they invade. He's saying that's what he's saying here in verse 9. If great gatherers, kept, if great gatherers come to thee, will they not leave some gleaning grapes? If thieves by night, they will destroy for they have enough. So it's saying that some most uh, other nation will, will still will take some, but will leave something back. But Esau doesn't leave anything. And this, is, and this level of cruelty has been a source of great displeasure to um, Yahuwah because it has subjugated nations or plunged nations who were previously not poor uh, into complete abject poverty. Um, yeah. And even resulted in the removal of peoples and nations as well. And this has been very, very displeasing to Yahuwah. But he goes on in verse 10 to then explain that this is the reason that, that he that Yahuwah made Esau bear. So what is he what is Yahuwah actually, actually saying here? Well, he's saying that Esau won't be able to hide himself. So is Yahuwah actually saying that this is the reason why Esau is white? Because that's what it appears to be saying um, here. That Yahuwah is so aggrieved at this particular sort of behavior that he wanted to make it clear to people when Esau is coming. So he's made it impossible for them to hide themselves. And that's why he's made Esau there. That's what it's meaning when it's saying that. Malachi 1, verses 2 to 4. So he's saying, I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yes, you say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Esau saith, whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord, Yahuwah, hath indignation forever. So Yehur is actually calling this uh, mystery Babylon um, system under um, under Rome uh, the border of wickedness, and really for these reasons um, that we have looked into tonight. So I think it's important to get some perspective and to get some balance, really, because the narratives that we see or that we are told to accept are not at all the accurate or the true uh, narratives um, at all. And it's important that we get some balance, um, I think. And we can do that best by actually looking into the word of God to see what God actually says about, uh, well, about everything, really. So um, it's, it is uh, quite important as well to ensure we don't actually buy into things that are, are not true. We're told to believe that a certain set of people are innately superior to another, whereas the Bible gives no, well, if anyone is superior, it would be Israel. Um, uh, let me just leave it at that. Not that, uh, that we are in a position to go around saying that. Um, most of us would never dare to say that, because it's just not, not even a polite thing to say or to do. Um, but anyway, we're given a lot of, a lot of narrators are just basic, basic lies, and often because um, many enforcement lies are smiling at us. Um, some of us are, appear to be confused as to what to believe. So uh, I think the scriptures we've looked at do really elaborate themselves. I won't uh, add much more to them um, than that. Remember, family, you and I, we are the repairers of the breach. As per Isaiah 58, 12, hashtag we will restore his paths. Hey there, my family. This is your brother, Dana, and I'm coming to you from the city of Atlanta. You know, the decision today from the Supreme Court was not a shock to me because we know that every system in this nation, including the justice and the Supreme Court, was made to sustain, maintain, and above all else, protect white supremacy, white power, white privilege. But see, 
this is what my white family don't understand. And what they don't understand is the time of us Gentiles is up. The time of the Gentiles is up, white family. So it doesn't matter about your military power. It doesn't matter about your president in the office. It doesn't matter even about the Supreme Court's decision to protect your white supremacy. Because the Bible says that the time of the Gentiles will come to a fulfillment and you are the generation to see and witness the fulfillment. Luke 21, 24, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword. Those are our black brothers and sisters and will be led away captive into all nations. That was our black brothers and sisters, ancestors that were taken into all nations by the Atlantic slave trade. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles who are our current white Ashkenazi Jewish people. And look up what ish on the end of the word means in the English language. And these Jewish Gentiles will trodden down Jerusalem until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. To you, my Gentile family members, the time of our reign has been fulfilled. It is now time for Jacob to rise to the head. Our black brothers and sisters that we have held captive underneath white supremacy for more than 400 years, they are the real Hebrews of the Bible. And what took place in Egypt to the powerful Pharaoh and his kingdom will be exactly what takes place into this mystery Babylon, the United States of America. As God or the Most High God comes to set his precious chosen children, our black brothers and sisters, the real Hebrews of the Bible, free. And so there is no Supreme Court ruling. There is no president, no army, no intelligence that you can have to hold back the Most High Yah God coming to get his children. Remember, Pharaoh thought he was all that in a bag of chips too. 